Hi, welcome to my first episode of Walk With History. Now, when I was a baby, Mama named me after the great Civil War hero, General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Who is Nathan Bedford Forrest? Why does he matter? Why is there a statue to him in the middle of Memphis? Hey, Nathan Bedford Forrest was a Confederate general in the Civil War. As you can see, the horse has both feet down, which means he survived the Civil War. Usually if a horse has one foot up, means he was injured, both feet up means he died, so. Both feet are down, which means he survived the Civil War. His body was moved here 28 years after he actually had been died and buried in 1905. And it's him and his wife that are actually buried here. Nineteen oh four, erected by his countrymen in honor of his military genius of Lieutenant General Nathan Bedford Forrest, Confederate States Army, eighteen sixty one, eighteen sixty five, and that is when he was a. Um, that's when the Civil War ended, of course. So he was born before the war, Bedford City, Tennessee. Uh, that is not too far from here, actually. He was the eldest of twelve, and at seventeen, he became head of his family. He had a twin sister named Fanny who, he also had a daughter named Fanny who died at five years of age and she's not buried here with him. He later went on to come down here to the Delta region of Memphis, Tennessee and start a plantation. And he was also a, a, a slave trader. By the time the Civil War had started, he was a millionaire. He's probably one of the richest men in the South. And he joined as a private, so he actually enlisted. Quickly, they learned how much money he had, they learned who he was, they made him a lieutenant colonel, they gave him the third Tennessee Cavalry, and he actually had no formal military training at all. They do say that he was physically imposing. He's 6'2", over 200 pounds, in a time when men in the Civil War were about 5'8", 140 pounds. He made a name for himself in the Civil War, no doubt. He was a good fighter. I require able-bodied men with good horse and gun. I wish none but those who desire to be actively engaged. Come on, boys. He met General Grant at Fort Donaldson. Um, he broke out of a siege with 4,000 men against General Grant. So there's no doubt. I mean, he was a force to be reckoned with. He led General Grant on a wild goose chase in Tennessee, staying long enough where anybody, never staying long enough where anybody could find him. And General Grant said he was the only Confederate that he ever um, dreaded. One of the big controversies about him is there was a massacre at Fort Pillow in 1864. He had captured that fort and um, it's actually two counties north of here in Tennessee. It's still along the Mississippi River. And people had surrendered and he, they ended up massacring those people that surrendered. 182 men, um, Union African-Americans, Union whites. The historian is claimed to say it was actually one of the saddest events in history. Nathan Bedford Forrest, Continued to fight with the Confederacy until Lee surrendered. He came back to the Memphis area, joined the railroad, the Memphis Railroad hired him, but he wasn't very good at it, didn't succeed, and went bankrupt. And in his final days, he actually was a, he worked on a prison work farm on President's Island. The nameplate of his great-great-grandson this is the third. He was a Brigadier General in the United States Army. He uh, was fighting in World War II. He was flying a bomber. He actually stayed with the bomber after all the men um, jumped out and the bomber was actually shot down and he was killed. So after the war, Nathan Bedford Forrest became the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan.
She said we was related to him in some way, and what he did was he started up this club called the Ku Klux Klan. They'd all dress up in their robes and their bed sheets and act like a bunch of ghosts or spooks or something. They'd even put bed sheets on their horses and ride around. And anyway, that's how I got my name, Forrest Gump. Mama said that the forest part was to remind me that sometimes we all do things that, well, just don't make no sense. Ku Klux Klan was started in 1865, um, probably about three, four hours directly east of here, a town called Polanski, Tennessee, and during Reconstruction. So Reconstruction basically means they're they were reconstructing the South. They were taking the 11 states that seceded from the Union and putting them back into the Union, into the Republic, making sure they reconstruct their state constitution to include the 14th Amendment. And people were coming down from the North with money and, of course, other ideas to reconstruct the South. They called those people carpetbaggers because they didn't have real luggage. They just threw everything into a carpet bag because it was easy to pack, like a duffel bag. And um, and so they, they there was a pushback. They didn't want these people down here. You, the Ku Klux Klan, in theory, was supposed to be started to push back from the Reconstruction. But from the get-go, it was violent. They wanted to, um, I mean, from the get-go, they wanted to maintain the white supremacy that was the social situation that was in the south before the civil war he was the first grand wizard of it and he was actually grand wizard from 1867 to 1869 and he claimed they did it to scare black voters because black voters were voting republican at the time that's uh, abraham lincoln was republican and um and his predecessors were republican but that's another reason why they want him removed from here uh, or 1875, I'm sorry, they claim his um, attitude changed. He actually gave a speech to a group of African-American Southerners, Southerners to um, advocate race, racial reconciliation. So it was the last public appearance that he made before he died. It was a friendly speech. He was offered flowers by an African-American African woman, and he um, stated he accepted them as a memento of reconciliation between the races. That was the last time he appeared in public. That's something he had stated. It was a lot about bringing the races together. It was published. He died in 1877 of complications of diabetes. And that is about all I know. So again, this is Nathan Bedford Forest. This is the Nathan Bedford Forest Park at 800 Union Avenue. This is my first walk with history. I am Jennifer Benny, signing off. So after Nathan Bedford Forrest dies in 1877, his wife dies in 1893, they're both buried at Elmwood Cemetery beside their daughter who has died at six years old from scarlet fever. It's in 1904 that his body and his wife's body are exhumed and reinterred at the park underneath the Nathan Bedford Forrest statue. Now. They leave Francis, the daughter, behind in the cemetery and just move him and his wife. There's been a lot of change and the statue has been removed and the bodies are going to be removed and they're not going back to Elmwood Cemetery. They are actually going to Columbia, Tennessee and there is a house there in Columbia, Tennessee that is belongs to the Sons of the Confederacy and it's called Elm Springs. And they will be reinterred at Elm Springs. And I think the statue, which is also now in the possession of the Sons of the Confederacy, will be re-erected at Elm Springs. What is at the Health Sciences Park now, where I did the original video? You can see pictures, I will cut a picture into so you can see there's fencing around the pedestal the stone pedestal. And I think there's Black Lives Matter um, painting around the fencing. 
And I think as soon as the bodies are exhumed, they can make the park into what, into something that would be more agreeable for the whole community. I hope you enjoy this walk with history.